Hey, I'm Neoma Finn. Again, with Halloween creeping in, the trees ablaze with one last glorious blast of beauty before winter sucks away their life and pushes us all inside behind closed doors and around warm fires with little more than our thoughts, computers, smartphones, and televisions to fill our minds with dreadful thoughts of eerie days filled with more night than sunlight. It's time for another tale of Halloween. (laughs) But first, have you purchased my new novel yet? No? Well, head on over to Amazon and get that order in. I'll post a link in the description box to make it easy on you. And if you're the type who prefers to read books in digital format, then you're in luck. Beginning Monday, October 24th, the ebook will be available on Amazon. I'll have it up on other formats before the week is out. Watch my community page for announcements as to where and when you can purchase it. Now, one of the most iconic images of Halloween is the witch. With her tall, pointed hat, black tattered dress, crooked nose, and jutting chin, she's as recognizable at Halloween as Santa Claus is at Christmas. Witches have been feared and sometimes revered since that time King Saul stopped by the Witch of Endor's house. Beginning in the 1400s, there was a craze to find and execute all witches, and as a result, most single women and widows throughout Europe were fair game for accusations that landed them in the fire pit or dangling from the end of the hangman's noose. A German priest even wrote a book on how to determine if someone was a witch, the Malleus Maleficarum. I could do an entire video on legends of witches, the story of Wiccans, and the injustice faced by most practitioners of natural healing. In fact, someday I will. But this is October. So instead, I want to share with you a story. It's rumored that it was written by Benjamin Franklin, but there's never been anything to prove it. Since it was written 150 years ago, I'm taking a great deal of artistic license, updating the language, and having just a little bit of fun with it. After all, it is Halloween. It happened over in Burlington at Mount Holly on October 12th, Saturday last. I guess there must have been around 300 people. They were all gathered there for the big event. A couple of citizens of that region, a handsome young farmer named Adam, and his beautiful young wife Jane, were accused of being witches. Oh, the crimes these two have committed. The horror of it. Why, do you know they actually made their neighbor sheep dance? Imagine that. Sheep dancing in the meadow. Sure, we'd all expect to see sheep dance every now and then. I myself have broken up many a drunken ball out in the pastures late on a Saturday night. I can tell you from personal experience, no one does the minuet quite like a little lamb. But these sheep were dancing in some uncommon manner. They were twisting and jumping about and humming a strange tune that sounded something like... Surely it must have been the devil's own music. And then there were the pigs. Those pigs were talking and singing up a storm. I imagine they were hoping the pigs would learn a musical instrument or two and form a band. Being the good God-fearing hogs that they were, however, all they did was quote the Bible and sing psalms, much to the great disappointment of the evildoers. Perhaps if they'd known their scripture, they'd have known not to cast their pearls before swine. But then the good folks at Burlington wouldn't have had a reason to gather that day at Mount Holly for the big circuit, I I mean trial, yeah, trial, I meant trial. It opened with a balancing act. Members of the audience were invited backstage to inspect the couple prior to the start. Men searched the body of the male prisoner looking for anything that might cause him to outweigh a Bible for everyone knows a witch can't outweigh a Bible. Women did the same for the female. They were looking in particular for pins and needles, for they, being sold by weight, and as you might already know, having purchased them lately at the general store, seem always to weigh at least the amount of a store clerk's hand. Once all were satisfied that neither victim, I mean culprit, was hiding anything that would make them heavier, they were brought to the stage. Adam was first to be weighed. He stepped onto the left pan of a very large scale. 
Then two young lads made their way through the crowd, pushing a wheelbarrow carrying the great Bible belonging to the local justice. Gingerly, and with some great effort, the book was lifted from the wheelbarrow and placed on the opposite scale. The king's good and peaceable subjects clung to each other with bated breath as they waited for the great balance to decide the man's fate. The line holding the two pans was cut in much to the horror and dismay of all present, except, of course, the two who were being tried. The pan holding the accused dropped to the ground while the other flew into the air. What magic was this? Their sorcery must be great indeed if they were able to outmaneuver the scales. Now Jane took her turn on the scale. Fearing that she might topple over in her weakened and starved state, she opted to sit. Again, the rope was cut, and again, despite the pounds she'd lost while hanging out in the town's pillory, the Bible did not match her weight. Anger and disappointment echoed through the crowd. A lady seated on an elevated terrace away from the masses sniffed her handkerchief in disapproval. There was a long pause while the judge and jury deliberated on their next course of action. The crowd began to grumble. Some, feeling they'd been cheated out of a right fine burning at the stake, asked for a refund on their tickets. How dare the authorities advertise for an event they had no intention of following through with? Finally, the judge took the stage and said, Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to a decision. He was an old man with a weak and unsteady tone, so the people moved in close. Startled by this sudden advance on his person, the old guy involuntarily cried, I'm not a witch! Uh, huh? What? He's a what? The crowd responded. Nothing, nothing, he said, gathering himself again. As I said, we have come to a decision. Adam and Jane were shoved onto the platform to stand beside him. We have here a man and woman who have been accused by some of you of being witches. Their deeds have been proven through your testimony against them, and I have no doubt that none of you would tell a lie that might see his neighbor hung from the scaffolding or burned, if you will, at the stake. However, our first test has either suggested their innocence or revealed their great powers. I'm inclined to believe in their innocence, the crowd roared in anger, or their sorcery skill, either way, either way, he quickly amended. But in order to prove that they deserve the fate that awaits them, and fear not, good people, we will find a way to ensure that fate is carried out. The crowd roared with delight. Yes, well, we have decided on a second test to prove their guilt. Assuming they will agree to the act, we'd like to bind them hand and foot and uh, toss them, gently, mind you, into yon body of water. The old man swept his arm into the direction of the lake at the edge of town, this, of course, being Lake Champlain. If they swim, we will know they are witches and sorcerers of the worst degree. He paused a moment while the crowd cheered. If they sink, however, we will have to accept their innocence and set them free. The crowd answered with boos and hisses. What say you then, good sir and madam? he asked of the two miserable souls on stage with him. Will you ascend to such a test? The man and woman, whose hands were already tied behind their backs, shuffled closer together. We're going to die, Adam whispered out of the side of his mouth. Maybe, Jane whispered back. But I have an idea. Follow my lead. Wait, what? Adam said, remembering that it was his wife's love of chasing lambs around the meadow that got them into this mess in the first place. Just go with it, she hissed before saying, Your Honor, my husband and I would gladly submit to this test on one condition. As her husband's eyes glazed over in disbelief, she called out to the audience, You, sir, Tom Pinkerton, and you, Goody Wilkins. You've each testified to our guilt. You each claim to have seen our dastardly deeds. Will you join us in the water? Mutterings floated up from the audience. Someone cried out that it would be a mockery of justice to drown good Tom Pinkerton, the local store clerk with rather large hands, and Goody Wilkins, who, in the absence of a newspaper, kept everyone apprised of the events and doings of the town and its people. Mm, That might not have been the best argument. 
Someone else quickly replied that their lives might indeed be worth the price of ridding the town of such unsavory souls. Yet another pushed at the back of Tom Pinkerton, forcing him to the front of the crowd. Goodwife Wilkins was likewise sent forward. Well, uh, I, uh... Tom Pinkerton began, pressing the back of his hand to his forehead and massaging it with the heavy ring he wore on his pen-weighing hand. You see, I, I, uh... His mind was racing. He had to find a way out of this. These clothes, he said. They're brand new, and I'd hate to get them wet. Oh, yes, Goody Wilkins agreed. I just purchased this bodice, and I'd hate to see it ruined. Oh, that won't be a problem, declared the judge. Well, not in the lake, then, Tom argued. In the mill pond. The judge looked to the accused. They nodded their agreement. With this, the four of them, the two accusers and the two accused, were led down to the mill pond. It was a solemn procession with only minimal dancing and merrymaking. Each was stripped, the men down to their bare skin, and the women down to their shifts and garters. At this point, the good men of the town felt it necessary to press to the front of the crowd, thereby preventing their wives and daughters from seeing such a wicked sight. Whether or not they were successful, we will never know as each of those men was focused entirely on the wicked sight. I see what you were doing there, Adam whispered as his clothes were pulled from his body. You figured if you'd try to get someone to do this with us, they'd all give up and go home. Yeah, whispered Jane. Didn't work, did it? No, answered Jane. Can you swim? No. Like I said, we're going to die, declared Adam. Yeah, answered Jane. The four were then rowed to the middle of the pond on a flatboat, where ropes were tied around their waists, and they were lowered horizontally over the side and into the cold water. At this point, neither Adam nor Jane was able to stay afloat. Like rocks, they sank immediately into the dismal depths of the dark and murky pond. Meanwhile, Tom Pinkerton, a scrawny man despite his large hands, was struggling to go under. Even the oversized ring on his pen-weighing hand wasn't enough to drag him down. It wasn't until one of the men who rode them out jumped off the flatboat and onto Tom's back that he finally managed to get his hair wet. He bobbed right back up, of course, as soon as the boatman slipped off of him. Ropes were thrown out to try and rescue the boatman, while Tom finally managed to sink just long enough to declare himself a good man absent of any dealings with the devil. Goodwife Wilkins, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. She was a plump woman, given to spending her time sitting in a chair in her front garden, watching the activities of her neighbors. She didn't have a lot of muscle under that fat. Fat floats. While the others floundered around in the water like one-footed ducks, she drifted peacefully toward the mill and was nearly swept up into the great water wheel before someone thought to throw her a rope and reel her in. Meanwhile, the man first accused and now sitting at the bottom of the pond discovered that, given the right circumstances, he could be quite the swimmer. So much so, in fact, that he could swim hands and feet tied and dragging his wife with him all the way back to the surface. As a direct result of these events, the judge had questions. Good sir, Pinkerton, what say you? he demanded. You were cast into the water, but you managed to stay afloat much longer than the accused. That's true, answered Tom Pinkerton. But you have to admit, I did sink. He crossed his fingers behind his back and awaited the verdict. True, you did sink, said the judge. I have to admit it is a bit suspicious, though. He scratched his wrinkled forehead and pushed back a wisp of gray hair. There's nothing in the books regarding how long it takes to sink. So I suppose I must declare you an innocent man. Next, the judge turned to Adam. And you've proved yourself quite the swimmer, sir, he pronounced. I had no idea, Adam said earnestly. I went straight to the bottom of the pond and I was sitting there thinking about how nice it'll be when I enter the pearly gates all dry and warm. And I got this sudden urge to live. The judge thought this over for a moment. We all saw you swim, sir. We saw you rescue your wife as well. Although I am inclined to declare you a wizard based on that feat, 
I have to admit only a good soul would take the time to save another when his own life is in the balance. And you did sink first. For that reason, I will declare you innocent. Unhappy as the crowd might have been with this decision, no one could deny the judge's wisdom. The judge then turned to the sopping wet and sobbing Goody Wilkins. And you, madam, you didn't sink at all. I was bewitched by that devil woman, she screamed as she pointed a moss-covered finger at Jane. She's evil, I tell you, evil! And yet you didn't sink, the judge reminded her. It would indicate a certain level of fraternization with the devil. The crowd, realizing they just might be in for a bonus burning, applauded its approval. I'm innocent, I tell you. That woman bewitched me. And yet, the only one who seems to have sank, and most likely would have stayed at the bottom of the pond if not for her husband, is the very woman you accuse, the judge pointed out. Then dunk me again, Goody Wilkins demanded. Dunk me a hundred times. Sooner or later, I will sink. Besides, that woman only sank because her stays and garters dragged her down. At this, the crowd went silent. Eyebrows, mostly male eyebrows, lifted. This was an interesting turn of events. The judge, thinking the same as every other man present, declared, You may have a point, madam. Therefore, I suggest that we all go home today, and perhaps, weather permitting, we'll reconvene here next week and attempt this test again on you two ladies, this time naked. With this, the crowd, at least the men in the crowd, gave a mighty cheer, lit the bonfires, and drank merrily through the night to a strange new song that made them all want to twist and jump about in a strange manner. That's all right, mama. That's all right with you. That's all right, mama. Any way you want it to. Well, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. I know this story wasn't my usual unsettling tale of the unexplained, but to me there are few things more frightening than crowd mentality when innocent lives are at stake. These days it seems more and more we're all likely to point our fingers at those we don't like and accuse them of the worst our minds can imagine. Let's not go backwards anymore. Let's find a way out of this witch hunt and learn to be fellow citizens of the world again. I'm Neoma Finn.